red sea bream is one of Japan's favorite fish. People have been eating it since ancient times. Raw, boiled, or grilled, there are many delicious ways to eat red sea bream. It has long been considered a lucky fish, and it's a prized offering to Japan's Shinto gods. During the 17th century, techniques to transport live fish over long distances were developed. This enabled city dwellers to get their first taste of red sea bream. As the red sea bream is an Welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in Tsukiji Fish Market, which is often called the Kitchen of Tokyo. There are over 200 different species of fish known as sea bream, but our focus on the program today is red sea bream. It's one of Japan's most expensive fish. I don't ever remember eating sea bream when I was growing up in London, and it's not a fish that's commonly eaten in the West. In Japan, it's known as tai, and that has overtones of the word meditai, which means auspicious. And that's one of the major reasons for its popularity in Japan, along with the rather attractive pinkish hue of the skin. Let's start off today with a look at the connections that this fish has to Japanese culture. Red sea bream has a subtle yet distinctive flavor. It is delicious eaten in all sorts of ways, and it has long held a special place in Japanese hearts. The simplest preparation is as sashimi. The fish's subtle sweetness and firm texture set it apart. It's also excellent as a sushi topping. Here is red sea bream simmered in a salty sweet mixture of soy sauce and sugar. Prepared like this, the flesh is soft enough to melt in your mouth. It has a rich flavor and goes very well with rice. Kanazawa has a local recipe for red sea bream that involves cutting open the fish, stuffing it with a mixture of tofu leaves and vegetables, and then steaming it. You can't have a true Kanazawa wedding without this special dish. Red sea bream is eaten on festive occasions, and a New Year's feast is another example. To make it ready for use in celebrations at the New Year, the fish is grilled a few days in advance. Celebrate with red sea bream! In the past, there was a custom that for the first three days of the year, the celebratory red sea bream could only be looked at. Not a single chopstick was allowed to touch it. That's how precious this fish was. In Japan, there is a tradition for babies to be given a ceremonial meal on the 100th day after their birth. That meal, too, must include red sea bream. This ritual dates back a thousand years, and it reflects the parents' wish that their child will never go hungry. Sumo, the national sport of Japan. After each tournament, a victory celebration is held for the winner, and it's customary for the winner to proudly hold up a large red sea bream. The red sea bream also plays an important role in other local customs. This is the town of Minamichita in Aichi Prefecture. 
This fishing community holds a Red Sea Bream Festival. The highlight is a 10 meter long sacred float in the shape of the fish. Inside the float, musicians play flutes and drums. The massive fish, weighing more than one ton altogether, is paraded through the town. But that is not all. The sea bream float is even carried into the sea. This Red Sea Bream Festival in Minami Chita is the community's way of praying for its livelihood, good fishing and large catches. Red Sea Bream have long been prized offerings to the Shinto deities. In Mikawa Bay in Aichi Prefecture is the small island of Shinojima, just nine kilometers in circumference. Red Sea Bream caught here are very special and are used in a Shinto ritual that is unique to this island. The fish are gutted, pickled in salt for 10 days, then dried. Five hundred of these Red Sea Bream are given every year as a sacred offering at Issei Jingu, a Shinto shrine that venerates the ancestors of the imperial family. These flying banners proclaim that the special sea bream are being brought as an offering to Amaterasu Omikami, the Shinto sun deity enshrined at Issei Jingu. Before the islanders set off with the fish, a purification ceremony is held at the harbour. The whole island takes pride in producing and offering these red sea bream to the sun deity, and they all gather to see off the shipment. Three times a year, an offering boat carries these fish across the sea to Issei Jingu. This ritual has been observed for a thousand years. It shows how the Red Sea Bream is much more than just food in Japan. It also has deep religious significance. This is actually inside Tsukiji Market, which is the world's largest seafood market, by the way. On an average day, they trade something like 480 different marine products, a total of about 2,000 tons. This is a shop that deals in red sea bream, among many other kinds of fish. And I'm going to speak to Mr. Shibahara, who works here, a little bit about it. Uh, first of all, can you show us some wild red sea bream? Here. Well, that's a really nice looking fish. What, what are the characteristics of this, uh, as opposed to the, the farmed ones? It has these spots, and also it's colored like it's wearing eyeshadow. I understand that there's a technique invented in Japan for preserving the freshness of these fish. Can you tell us something about that as well? You insert a knife under the gill and sever the nerves running through its body. What difference does that make when you do that? The fish stays fresh longer and it delays post-mortem rigidity. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, move on now. We'll take a look at uh, how the Japanese acquired their fondness for Red Sea Bream. This is an archaeological site dating back 5,000 years to Japan's prehistoric Jomon culture. Fish bones found here indicate that the Japanese were eating sea bream even then. But until the 15th century, carp were held in higher regard than Red Sea Bream. The capital at Kyoto was far from the sea. The only fresh fish available were freshwater varieties. The fact that carp were seen as noteworthy in China also contributed to their special status. Later, when the samurai gained power, Red Sea Bream became extremely popular. By the 17th century, the Red Sea Bream was considered the king of fish. Its barbed fins and tough scales were compared to the best samurai armor. In 
In Japan, red has long been considered a lucky color, symbolizing good fortune and long life. The beautiful color of red sea bree made it a prized gift among samurai. The shoguns were served this fish three times a day. The illustrious founder of the Tokugawa dynasty, Ieyasu, was himself very fond of red sea bream, particularly when it was prepared as tempera. As the popularity of red sea bream spread, fishermen everywhere tried to catch them. In the great city of Edo, as Tokyo was then called, demand for red sea bream drew supplies from far and near. Once it became possible to transport live red sea bream, the fish could be eaten fresh, even in Edo. There was a saying, real men are samurai. The heart of a real home is Hinoki Cypress, and real fish are red sea bream. In 1785, a red sea bream cookbook containing 102 recipes was published and became a bestseller. Here's a rice dish that combines pricey red sea bream with humble pickled daikon radish. And here the red sea bream is marinated in miso, then preserved in sugar. The book is full of unique recipes that wouldn't usually occur to a modern Japanese cook. The red sea bream is also an indispensable prop for the seven gods of fortune. Ebisu, the god of fishing, holds a fishing rod and a red sea bream. Originally associated with good fishing, he came to be seen as a god of all commercial success. Red sea bream put business in the black. In Osaka, a city of merchants, faith in Ebisu is deep-rooted. A shrine called Imamiya Ebisu Jinja in Osaka has held a ritual red sea bream offering for hundreds of years. Each January, some of the largest red sea bream caught in Japan are brought here. The two best are presented as an offering to Ebisu. That's one example of how the red sea bream remains a potent symbol of business prosperity. More and more people aspired to... Techniques for raising the fish from eggs also developed. Today, 80% of the red sea bream consumed in Japan are farm raised. The popularity of this fish has remained undimmed since samurai times. This is a restaurant that specializes in red sea bream and they have fresh fish shipped in here every day from Ehime prefecture in the west of Japan. And this is the dish I've ordered. So I'll take that off and this is what we have. Underneath there's a bed of rice and on top of it there's red sea bream which has been marinated in a mixture of soy sauce and sesame. And the soup here is, it's a soup stock taken from fish. I'm gonna dig straight in. This is one of my favorite dishes. I absolutely love this. Now let's take a piece of red sea bream. Mmm. Mmm. They put sashimi, raw fish, in here that's been marinated. So it's, it, it's in the soup, so it's been heated a little bit, and um, some of the thinner parts are softer. This thicker part here in the middle is still half raw. Now, that's really good, and there's a firmness to the flesh as well. Mmm. Let's try the soup. Mmm. The soup has this very savory flavor to it, of course. I can't really explain it adequately. I'm sure you really have to try it, but it's really, really good. Red sea bream can be caught using nets, although because that tends to bruise the flesh, the best way to catch them is using a hand line. And as they eat just about anything, there are a number of different ways to catch them, each using different kinds of bait. Let's take a look at some of the different techniques used by veteran fishermen. Ehime Prefecture boasts the largest red sea bream catches in Japan. Shigenobu Higaki has been fishing for red sea bream for 30 years. Today he's after cherry sea bream, which is what red sea bream are called in the spring when they're about to spawn. 
Higaki is very particular about the bait he uses. A specific type of squid about three centimeters long. After putting the squid on hooks, he separates them into individual compartments to keep them lively. He frequently adds seawater to the boxes so that the squid stay in good condition. Now he's ready for his remarkable fishing method which makes use of squid behavior. It happens when they're threatened. The squid puff out ink. When squid on the hook are moved up and down with the fishing line, they become startled and eject ink. Red sea bream are drawn to the ink. Higaki raises his arm to make the squid produce ink. He's just got a bite. This fishing method passed down through the centuries is all about fingertip finesse. He draws the line in carefully to ensure no fish will break free. This is a nice one. Oh, I've got another one too. A good big one. A real cherry sea bream. Look how plump it is. I can eat it now. This is the Naruto Strait in Tokushima Prefecture. It's notorious for whirlpools and for the fastest tidal currents in Japan. It's said that in these fierce currents, red sea bream become especially muscular and that means they taste really good. Tadao Noguchi has been fishing for Red Sea Bream in the Naruto Strait for 50 years. He uses the Japanese sand lance for bait. These small fish, about three centimeters long, are a favorite food of Red Sea Bream. One line has seven hooks, and each hook is baited with a Japanese sand lance. Next, he attaches a tube about 50 centimeters long. Live sand lances are poured into the tube. The tube is capped, then dropped overboard. The baited hooks go down with it. When the tube reaches the seabed, the cap is opened and the sand lances swim out. The lure of live bait draws in Red Sea Breams swimming nearby. The tube is dropped exactly where the seabed changes from sandy to rocky. Using decades of experience, Noguchi guides the tube to where the seabed is 60 meters deep. He says that missing his target by even two meters would result in failure. Noguchi must read the rapid and complex currents to place his line in the right spot. As soon as the tube touches bottom, he has a bite. Fishing with a hand line is a battle of wits with the Red Sea Bream. Veteran fishermen use every trick in the book to get delicious Red Sea Bream onto the dinner table. Now they've prepared one more dish for me here and it's here in this clay pot which I can tell is extremely hot. I'm going to have the chef who's here next to me open it up for me. Oh, look at that. This is the quintessential way to serve red sea bream. It's cooked with the rice in the pot and it looks amazing for a start. Not to mention that the aroma is absolutely intoxicating. I can't wait to get into this. Okay, uh, the chef is now going to take the meat off the bones and mix it all up and prepare it. So, be back with you in just a moment. And just look at this, isn't this fabulous? The meat of the fish has all been mixed into the rice. And this topping 
is a mixture of various things. The, the, the skin of the fish has been grilled and cut up fine, uh, and then you've got some herbs and sesame as well. Yeah. Mm. Now, interestingly, this has a very fishy taste, and the reason for that is normally rice is boiled using plain water. But in this restaurant, for this dish, they make a broth out of the red sea bream bones, and they use that to cook the rice. So you have the, the flesh of the meat plus the broth as well. Taste is really, really good. Now, aren't these cute? Don't they remind you of something? These are actually part of the skeleton of the fish after it was deboned for me just now. And because of the shape, they're sometimes called bream within the bream. Some people even take them home as souvenirs, particularly if the meal happens to have been a special occasion, like a wedding celebration or something. Now, the sea bream that I've been just eating happen to be uh, wild, but 80% of the red sea bream eaten in Japan is farmed. In the 1980s, there was a period where there was a glut on the market, and that drove down prices to the point where life was very difficult for the producers. But at least that competition did spur efforts to improve the quality of farmed fish. And in turn, that then stimulated the market to improve gradually as the years went by. The sheltered inlets of Uwajima in Ehime Prefecture are filled with fish farms. Meet Manzo Okayama. For 30 years, he has been raising red sea bream here. He ships 120,000 of them a year. As the fry grow larger, he moves his pens to the open sea where the currents are stronger in order to put more muscle on the fish. It takes him two years to raise each fish that he sells. He uses eight different sizes of feed for the red sea bream at different stages of growth. If the feed is even slightly too large or too small, the fish won't eat as well and their growth will slow. He also uses machines to dispense the food bit by bit over two hours. The fish don't jockey for food so much and therefore feel less stress, but they do get enough to eat. It's often said that farmed red sea bream smell fishy and don't look nice. Okayama wanted to do better and he focused on improving the fish feed. Previously he had used live sardines, but it was their oiliness that gave the flesh of the red sea bream a fishy smell. So he dried the sardines to eliminate the oiliness and then ground them up. This became his feed of choice. It contains fats, proteins, carbohydrates and vitamins. The improved feed is so good that even people can eat it. He worked with a feed maker to adjust the vitamin and mineral composition through trial and error, based on his observations of the Red Sea Bream's feeding habits. The premium feed Okayama uses now has 45 different ingredients. Not only does this feed speed up growth, it makes the flesh free of fishy odor. Okayama also has special ways to raise fish so that they look appealing. he keeps the pens covered with black tarpaulins. Wild red sea bream live at great depths where they receive little sunlight. But farmed fish are raised in pens just below the water surface where the sun's rays tend to blacken them. So each pen is covered with a sheet to make sure the fish don't get sunburned. color of wild red sea bream comes from the food they eat. They feed mainly on shrimp and crabs, 
which contain a pigment called astaxanthin. This produces the characteristic beautiful red hue. Okayama knew this, so he mixed into the feed a substitute for astaxanthin. This is a pigment extracted from a red flower called the adonis that grows around the Mediterranean. He experimented with different recipes to see how the color of the fish would change. Ultimately, he came up with the perfect blend for producing the Red Sea Bream's beautiful color. If I'm going to cultivate Red Sea Bream, then I want to produce ones that are just like wild fish. I'll keep working to get my fish as close to wild ones as possible. Okayama's determination and extensive studies have paid off. Some farm red sea bream now compare favorably to wild ones in both flavor and appearance. Fish farms with sunshades, it's astonishing the lengths people will go. I'm going to have one more illustration now of the Japanese love for these creatures. Take a look here. This is a sweet that's known as taiyaki, which literally means grilled sea bream. There's no fish in it at all, but uh, I'm going to have one and we'll see what it is made out of. Well, got one fresh off the griddle here. See, isn't that cute? And you break it apart here. This dark red, purpley looking stuff in the middle is made out of azuki beans uh, with, mixed with sugar, so it's sweet and it's batter on the outside. Mmm, piping hot. And really tasty. We've given you a little glimpse on today's show of just how much the Japanese people love these red sea breams. And um, if you do come to Japan, you should try them out. Leave these ones as well, but the real ones, of course. Um, I'm surprised sometimes why they're not eaten more in the West. They really are absolutely delicious. Anyway, I'm going to munch a bit more on this. I'll see you again next time. Next time on Begin Japanology, shopping streets. Not simply commercial facilities, shopping streets in Japan play a key role in building community spirit. Welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm in Tsukiji Fish Market, which is often called the Kitchen of Tokyo. There are over 200 different species of fish known as sea bream, but our focus on the program today is red sea bream. It's one of Japan's most expensive fish. I don't ever remember eating sea bream when I was growing up in London, and it's not a fish that's commonly eaten in the West. In Japan, it's known as tai, and that has overtones of the word meditai, which means auspicious. And that's one of the major reasons for its popularity in Japan, along with the rather attractive pinkish hue of the skin. Let's start off today with a look at the connections that this fish has to Japanese culture. Red sea bream has a subtle yet distinctive flavor. It is delicious eaten in all sorts of ways, and it has long held a special place in Japanese hearts. Red sea bream is one of Japan's favorite fish. People have been eating it since ancient times. Raw, boiled, or grilled, there are many delicious ways to eat red sea bream. It has long been considered a lucky fish, and it's a prized offering to Japan's Shinto gods.
During the 17th century, techniques to transport live fish over long distances were developed. This enabled city dwellers to get their first taste of Red Sea Bream. As the Red Sea Bream is an The simplest preparation is as sashimi. The fish's subtle sweetness and firm texture set it apart. It's also excellent as a sushi topping. Here is red sea bream simmered in a salty sweet mixture of soy sauce and sugar. Prepared like this, the flesh is soft enough to melt in your mouth. It has a rich flavor and goes very well with rice. Kanazawa has a local recipe for red sea bream that involves cutting open the fish, stuffing it with a mixture of tofu leaves and vegetables.